Hey students, it's Kathleen here, making sure that the Zoom webinar runs smoothly. We'll get started in a couple of minutes. In the meantime, we're gonna, you might see some polls showing up soon. Please take a moment to fill those out. We would appreciate it. And also for the attendees with us, besides filling out those polls, which I see it populating, thank you. You guys also see a chat icon. When you click on it, please hit the drop down and select all panelists and attendees. It helps us see your messages better. Other attendees can see your messages. It gets captured on recordings. Um, I see Steven, thanks for saying hi, doing the test. Um, please take advantage of that chat pod. That's how you'll be communicating with the presenters here. So we will start in a couple of minutes. We do, you are seeing one poll right now. We do have a couple of others. So we're gonna give it a little bit to let you guys fill these out. Thank you to all those saying hi. Hope everyone is safe and well. So we're still having people fill out the first poll here. We have two more to go, I believe. And then we'll start soon. So thanks again for everyone that's joining us. All right, we got a second poll up. So how about you guys go ahead and fill this one out? Simple yes or no? And if neither applies for whatever reason, feel free to type your comments in the chat. We'll, we'll take a look at those. I see a couple of people in the meantime, we'll start soon. I see a couple of people utilizing the raise hand function. Just FYI, just go ahead and type in the chat instead. Um, that'll be the best way that we see your comments. So I'm just gonna go ahead and lower them. All right, last poll, everyone. So uh, attendees, you guys don't mind, go ahead and fill this out. Once we finish this poll, then we'll get going in just a bit. Thanks again for your patience. Just giving time for people to join us. But Gabriella, you should have had a poll that appeared. If not, it's okay. We were just kind of getting some information. Just go ahead and keep typing in the chat pod instead. And for those that just joined, I mentioned this earlier, I see a little bit of a mix, but for attendees, if you guys can make sure when you chat to hit the drop down, select all panelists and attendees, that helps everyone to see your comments, you know, engage people, we get it all in the recording, that would be great. And we'll be starting in probably less than a minute. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close that out. So Hector, are you okay if I go ahead and start the recording? I am. I'm ready to go. Okay, Hector, you're welcome to speak in three, two, one. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. My name is Hector Verdugo. I'm the Senior Vice President of Admissions for Academy of Art University in San Francisco, California, USA. I see once again, we have tons of people from all over the globe out there. If you don't mind, let's get started with a couple of quick little uh, reminders here. Take a look down below. If you see that chat button, make sure that you've clicked that chat. And when it says to, please move to all panelists and attendees so that we can see your chats. Today, we wanna make this fun and interactive. We wanna make this to be uh, an amazing event here. We have some wonderful directors, faculty, uh, call them what you want. Just make sure that you call them amazing artists here to uh, help guide us through tonight and have a lot of fun with some interactive stuff. So uh, before we get started, 
We are going to have a social media piece. If you're out there and you can paint along, if you can sketch along, draw along, if you have crayons, it doesn't matter. Just try to have some fun tonight and learn some fun stuff with us. First thing I'm gonna put here in the chat link is I wanna go ahead and just put that hashtag. So if you have social media on Instagram or Facebook, I know that we're gonna have a lot of people probably exchanging information tonight, but the hashtag for tonight's work is hashtag SF landscape challenge uh tonight we're going to be painting something you guys might have heard of before it's called the golden gate bridge it's one of the most iconic bridges in the entire universe so i want to make sure that you're out there and you're sketching and you're drawing tonight please participate we love to see all the amazing work that people are working on out there so before we get started let's do a couple of little shout outs here uh where's everybody from here let's go ahead and uh we saw some polls i saw I saw a lot of folks out there. We have Marilyn, hello from New York. New York, how are you doing out there? Valerie, India, we have in the house. China, Anyahaseo for my friends out there in Korea. Nihama, Lehoma, welcome out there from people in China. Texas, howdy out there. Hola in Colombia. It's great to see everybody out there. San Francisco, Texas is in the house. One more time for H-Town. We have Egypt in the house, Istanbul, Virginia people in California. So it looks like we're representing all over the place here. Belinda in Miami, hello out there. Wonderful, so it's exciting to see everybody. One thing I wanna do is I wanna take a quick second before we introduce our special guest here tonight is what I would like to do is promote our next event. I have actually seen some of these names before out there and I know that you've attended with us multiple events. Some of you have been with me all the way here. I even saw Steve out there. I even recognize Steve's name because Steve has been with me for our head sketching, Game of Thrones, online workshops. So I appreciate some of you folks that are repeating and coming back every single time. But let me go ahead and promote our next one. So we have on the 28th of April, same time here, save this link in RSVP if you can. We have Jana Sue Memel. She is an Oscar award winning writer. She is the head of our motion picture television program. This is going to be a little bit of a different program here because we're going to have specific workshops for people that are interested in learning about cinematography, film directing, and writing. So if you have any interest whatsoever, come join us for that event. That's going to be super cool just to learn about how all that works. And then after that, on May 5th, we're going to have a fashion workshop. So anybody out there that's into fashion, clothing, this is going to be really cool, held by Robert. Uh, Robert is going to basically be teaching us how to do cuts and draping. We've actually designed a workshop that's going to be interactive so that students can participate with this even at home. So once again tonight, if you can draw along, do anything with us to participate, I'm going to be on Instagram tonight. You'll see me liking your photos and commenting on your work, but we definitely want to have a challenge here to see who can keep up with the, with the main event guy here, Mr. Craig Nelson. Hashtag is SF Landscape Challenge. So Enough out of me, let me introduce our special guests tonight that are gonna be helping us out. First, I'd like to introduce uh, Anna Marie Nelson. She goes by Anna. Uh, she is our online director of painting and printmaking. So Anna will be participating. She started teaching still life painting in 1992. She's a UCLA graduate with a degree in Italian language and literature. She also attended the Art Center of College, uh, I'm sorry, Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. Uh, and was an illustration major. So she has some wonderful painting techniques and skills she'll be sharing with us. And she'll be also in our chat on our YouTube channel as well. And also the person that will be uh, demonstrating the live painting today will be Dr. Craig Nelson. He's our executive director of painting and printmaking for the School of Fine Art. So Craig has over 30 years of experience. Uh, his bio is so long, I'm gonna just give you a snippet of it, but. He's depicted tons of figures and landscapes all over California and coastal views, tons of oil paintings with vibrant colors. He's designed movie posters, book covers, album covers, Broadway production posters. If it's something that's been designed out there, this guy has most likely had his finger in something famous out there. Lots of great stuff. Uh, Craig has also won more than 200 different awards in various different shows, five gold medals, four silver medals from different organizations, including the Society of Illustrators and the California Art Club. So I wanna go ahead and pass this over here to our special guests that are gonna be performing tonight and teaching you everything. 
that's enough out of me. I'll be here in the chat box to answer your questions and make sure that we make this live and interactive. So the show is to you, Craig. Thank you, Hector. Um, a couple of things Hector said that I kind of want to reiterate on because everything he just said that their upcoming uh, workshops, I'm interested in all that stuff. I mean, I've been an illustrator and a painter pretty much most of my adult life since really 1970. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm not interested in a lot of these other things. What I find is all of the arts are in one way or another interconnected. Um, I believe that if you take, for example, the classes in our department, which is fine art, painting and drawing, and even printmaking, uh, they all relate. Animators take our courses, illustrators take our courses, visual development, game design, it all relates. And most of the people that I know that are in all these areas are gifted artists. They're not one trick ponies. They don't do one thing well. They have a lot of versatility. It's one of the wonderful things about the Academy of Art is the versatility. All the different departments. We work together, we're interrelated, we constantly communicate. Um, even though we're all in our separate schools, we're in constant communication as to what's going on and we're extremely appreciated of one another. It's a very symbiotic relationship with all our departments. So what I wanna start with, is I'm gonna do a little uh, 18 by 24 landscape. Hopefully we'll get it done in a little over an hour and uh, I'll give you as much information. I tend to talk a lot while I paint. So if you guys have questions, please put them in. In the meantime, I'm just gonna pretty much be telling you what I'm doing. I'm starting, I work with basically these types of brushes. This one tends to be a flat. It's my rosemary. Um, this one is another rosemary brush. These are my one of my favorite uh, brush makers. Is, and they're a little expensive. They're not terribly expensive, but this is a, a synthetic mongoose. This is a very inexpensive, looks like a little house painting brush, doesn't it? And I use this a, a lot in my lay-in when I'm first working. Then I use something occasionally, not not as often, uh, something we call an Egbert. And it's a big, long, kind of rounded, pointed brush that's, you can do all kinds of interesting things like feeling of hair, uh, weeds, things of that nature. So it's really great. Uh, my palette is usually relatively the same. Uh, tonight it's comprised of, and I'm gonna point it out on the palette now. Uh, I have a titanium white, a yellow oxide. I don't always lay a cad orange out, but I did because I need a little touch of it on that bridge. Same with the cad red light. A lizard crimson is my really dark, rich red. Um, I actually have a purple laid out. I don't always lay this out, but sometimes I will use purple and sap green. It's dioxide purple and sap green, and it mixes a wonderful black. I always have ultramarine blue. Because I'm doing a lot of sky, I laid out two different blues. Uh, this one is called Radiant Blue. This is called Radiant Turquoise. They're both by Gamblin. This is Sap Green. I always have Sap Green on my palette. I always have usually a Burnt Umber on my palette. So that gives you an idea of, of my palette. Um, I use Turpin, Turpinoid, which is, it's, I actually use something called Gamsol by Gamblin. It's a very low toxicity turp. Uh, I'm going to be working in oils. My palette is a glass palette. I make, I make the glass palette. I have several of these. It's basically a piece of glass and a piece of um, plywood that I painted gray. I laid glass down on top of it, put duct tape around the edges. And what's great about it is I can use a scraper and I can clean it just very easily. So it's a very, very flexible tool. All right, I'm going to get started here using this kind of inexpensive, uh, they call it a gesso brush. I think this is a, a Blick gesso brush. It's a one inch. So first thing I'm gonna do is I always start with, when I'm doing landscapes, I start from the background. Um, and I started really as a figure painter. And I still do, I would say at least 50% of my work involves figures. Uh, so it's just to give you an idea, um, one of the things that we try and do is train people to be good at as many things as possible. Um, so you're not, as I said, you're not kind of handcuffed to one type of thing. It also gives you the opportunity 
to be flexible. For example, we have a lot of our students, even from the fine art area, that end up working for companies like Pixar. They work for companies like Disney. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that they have these skills, these incredible skills. Um, they, they understand how to use the computer, but they also understand color mixing. They understand creating distance. Uh, they understand creating form. And so they're pretty well sought after. And again, it's one of these, th these are kind of skills that really will benefit you for the rest of your life. Uh, they're really these kinds of things that, that you can take and work on. And there's a lot of people that go into art direction, graphic design, and I'm well aware of this. And uh, I know a lot of them because I know a lot of art directors and they all tell me, I want to paint, I want to be a painter. Uh, and it's one of these things that even if you say, go into something like graphic design, go into something like animation. Um, some of my closest friends uh, that are wonderful artists did The Lion King, they worked on Beauty and the Beast, they worked on Cars, they worked on Toy Story. So uh, we, it's, it's very interrelated. It's one of the things I just can't stress enough. So we have kind of a, a approximate flat sky laid in. You can see that it didn't take me that long to lay it in. Now I notice I'm, I'm actually painting what I call three San Francisco icons, three famous things about San Francisco. The Golden Gate Bridge in the distance, and that's gonna be our star. That's gonna be the kind of our key. Then we have down at the bottom, hidden by these trees, some of the Presidio, the famous San Francisco Presidio that has in many respects been restored. Uh, George Lucas took over part of it and built uh, ILM, uh, Industrial Light Magic. And then the thing that I think everybody that knows anything about San Francisco is the San Francisco fog in here. This is gonna be the famous San Francisco fog as it, right as it's lifting. So this happened to be, it's wonderful when you can go out and paint on location, but with uh, the social distancing and everything going on, uh, many of the artists, pretty much have to work indoors, which I've been doing quite a bit of lately. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to go a little bit lighter than the sky. So I took kind of the same colors I was using for the sky, which is a combination of those blues and a little bit of white. And we're going to kind of go in and kind of rough in where the fog goes. Nothing when you, when you're, all right, let me uh, explain something that I, I think I want to explain the difference between drawing and painting. Um, when people draw, what you are doing is you are dealing with the contour, the outside of whatever you're, you're working on. So you're dealing with the outside, the lines that are around things. And in reality, in, in real life, there are no lines. All we see is shapes and tones. That's what we see. So what the line has become is a graphic in indication of what's in front of us. It's, it just depicts the contour, the edge. It is the shapes, which is what painting is all about. It is the shapes, the value, um, and the different color variations that we see. And when we draw with line, we are really working on the outside edge. Uh, Nothing wrong with that. That's how most of us start to learn. So what we do is we kind of take you in a little bit of a different direction because what we do is we kind of get you involved in understanding the tones. There's many aesthetics involved and it really doesn't matter what style you paint in. If you love abstraction, you will, you will still get your foundations as much as some of the most famous abstract artists like Picasso that you get your foundations in drawing pretty much what you see, not necessarily uh, abstracting it. All right, once you start to get that down, you actually begin to understand the use of the brush, the use of tones, the use of colors, and what you can do with it. And once that happens, you actually have a better handle on beginning to depict any form of art you want, be it abstraction, be it um, expressionism, uh, be it impressionism, 
or we have students that go into photorealism. So all of those things. One of the things that you do is you just kind of rush things in. This is called a lay-in. So there we've got basically the fog. Now, if you notice, I left this part alone. Part of it is there's a mountain here. I'm going to put that in, little one here. And then the fog at the very top tends to get thinner, not as dense. And because of that, it's a little bit more white and it actually has a little warmth to it. You can see a little bit of sun on the bridge. So we're going to do that. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put those mountains in. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Hey, Greg. Yes. One quick question out there was, uh, what did you use uh, before you, uh, before you uh, painted? What, what did you use for a medium to sketch that out? I used a little bit of turp or uh, the Gamsol, a little bit. I used a small brush and I'll show it to you like this. And, uh, and what I did is I mixed a little bit of the uh, umber and the ultramarine. And then I'll show you exactly, if you can see my palette, there's the ultramarine. I mean, excuse me, there's the umber and there's the ultramarine. That kind of neutralizes it so it isn't necessarily a brown or a blue. Add a little bit of turp. I wipe it down on the brush. I mean, on a, on a thing. And then I sketch. And that's basically what I did. It's just kind of sketch like that. It's, this is called a very rough lay-in. Now, what did you tone the canvas with? Excuse me? What did you tone the canvas with? Oh, I out? toned the canvas initially. Uh, uh, you don't always have to do this. I do it some, I actually do it most of the time. I shouldn't say sometimes. Uh, I tone it, I usually take what we call two complements, which are opposites. And in this case, it's like a little bit of an orange or a burnt sienna, a little bit of blue, which is the opposite, and then white. And tr I try and kind of mix a tone that's, I would say, similar to the value of my flesh tone, pretty light. Now, the reason I do that, let me explain real quickly, is by mixing, I'm mixing a lot of white and just a little bit of yellow ochre because this is where we're gonna put, but watch, because there's the tone of the canvas. Now look, I can paint a light on that canvas as well as mediums and darks. You can't do that on white. On white, uh, there's nothing wrong with working on white. In fact, today I was working on white. So, but you can see that you can work this around and now we've got the light of the, fog at the top. So you can do it quite quickly. Now this, I'm going to lay in um, this mountain and I add a lot of white to it. I don't want it to stand out. It's way in the background. It's way in the background. When something's this far back, you want it painted a little bit more close to what the sky is like. So we're just going to kind of brush that in. Then there's another mountain that comes in here. This is, we're actually looking over towards uh, Marin County, the Marin area over here. And that's what's on the other side of the bridge. Hector, so, do you want me to move the camera in a little closer? Yeah, I think the crowd's asking us to move in a little closer to the painting so we can see more of the detail, if that's okay. okay. Yeah, let me try to do that. It's fine with me. I just want to make sure I don't bump it. I'm, I'm pretty good about being careful about that, but. Does that help? She can zoom in too. If you guys I want. I can't actually. If, oh, you can't zoom. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, so we have just kind of the rough idea of where these mountains are back here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start coming forward. The next thing I see is San Francisco Bay. Sometimes on gray days, it's gray and choppy. This was one of those wonderful days when the fog had just lifted and it was absolutely gorgeous and this beautiful blue color. So we want to get that in there. I want it to be a little bit darker and a little bit more colorful than the sky. And again, I'm using that same brush. Primarily I'm using this brush actually for two reasons. Number one, speed. I can get things in quickly. And number two, I don't overwork. One of the, one of the biggest problems when people start painting is they want that first stroke to be perfect. And if you notice, nothing here is perfect. Uh, everything as we come closer to completion will hopefully, I'm not going to say it's going to be perfect, but it's going to be more refined. So right now, that's why I was trying to explain that this is what we call the lay-in. Some people call it a block-in, but that's what this stage is. I mean, just, we kind of paint a little bit around things, but at the same time, don't worry if you overlap. So we just get enough of this stuff in here. 
And so we're gonna get the bridge, we're gonna get this water going back right about in here. On the, so we kind of see it through the trees. So right at the horizon, it tends to get, that it's actually not the horizon, but where the water um, is in, way in the distance and almost meets the fog. It's a little bit lighter. So I'm gonna just hit a little bit. I'm just gonna brush it over. Kind of almost, just go, by going back and forth a few times, you almost get kind of a blend. You get a little bit of striation in the water. So I can take the same color and just bring a few other, so the water has a little movement, but I've really enhanced the color of the water, especially compared to the fog. All right, now I'm gonna keep coming forward. The next thing, there is a little pier back here. So we're gonna paint that in. It's gonna be a little darker because it's closer to us. A quick question, can you use uh, vegetable oil as a replacement for a thinner? E, you know, yes, it, it isn't great, but you, I know people that have. Uh, I use safflower oil um, that I get. You can use linseed oil. Uh, it's a little bit better than vegetable, but you, I know people that have used vegetable oil. Uh, I, I, it, isn't, it isn't what I highly recommend, but it is doable. So uh, I, I pr my preference is safflower or linseed. Either one of those work really well. So that's where the pier goes. So I, I wanna make sure that pier is not as dark as trees are gonna be. Very important, all right? So that pier is back there. Then we get a little bit of really, and I'm gonna switch over to a smaller brush, like a number, oh, let's go with a number 10. It's an, or excuse me, a number eight flat right here. So what we're gonna do is gonna paint the roofs of these wonderful orange kind of tile roofs of the um, Presidio in. So we're gonna use a little ochre, a little cad red light. I wanna dull it down on the shadow side. So this is gonna be the light side. Let's I like to test first. That feels pretty good. I'm gonna add just a touch of white to it. And we'll do it again. Okay, there's that roof. We want it to stand out. So there's, there's the side. Now it's a little bit more red comes out here, down. So we, uh, this is where we're overlapping. So I want this to overlap what's down there already. And we're gonna paint the side of that roof. I'm gonna take a little bit more ochre, maybe a touch more red. So it goes a little darker. And I've got some dirty color over here that I was drawing with, and I added a little bit of that dirty color into it. Now, what we're gonna do with that is it should be slightly darker, if I'm correct. Yeah, it's a little bit more red than I want, so I'm gonna add more of that dirt. By dirt, you can add a little blue, you can add just something to kind of dull it down so it is not as intense or as bright. So this is the shadow side, and it's a little bit brighter down here. Whoops, when the paint doesn't go down easily, and you're having to struggle, it means that you don't have enough medium in your paint. So by putting a little bit more medium, medium can be turp or it can be oil. And whenever I say turp, that's, that's just kind of a generic term for Gamsol right now. So we're gonna hit it there. We're gonna hit a little bit in here because this is where we see the roof, see a little bit of a roof up in here. We're just putting it because we're gonna overlap it with trees. So I don't have to sit there and be very specific. If I get it, in too large of an area, great, no problem whatsoever. And a little over here, and then there's a little bit of a roof line right in here. We can hit that, just kind of scrub it in, because I sketched in, well, I didn't sketch it in very well either, uh, the top of one of the buildings of the Presidio. And then back behind it, there's a, actually a, a more dull looking roof, which is right about here. I just mixed some brown into that color and that dulled that color down, so, all right. Then we've got the roof as it goes down, meaning it goes this way and then down. And as it goes down, it darkens. So it goes more like, that's pretty close, you know? I'm always surprised when I get it pretty close on the first try. Usually I don't. Hey, Craig. Yes. A couple of questions out there. One person started, the, uh, the first question was um, from Leslie out there, she said, why did Craig begin with lights and not darks? Is there any particular reason? Well, basically I have. You just don't realize, I haven't built, or 
built a lot of, I haven't put the lights in on the buildings, put the light sky in, the light, the dark really is gonna be, and I'm just gonna put a stroke up here just so you know what I'm talking about. Um, but I'm gonna put a little bit of a dark in just to show you how we bring what's up front forward. So there's a dark. So you can see that's the dark of the tree. What, I, what you wanna always do if you can is paint from I always I use this terminology, paint from there to here, or paint from the background forward, and then go back and do your refinements. So basically what I'm doing is I'm laying in all these things that are now behind the, um, uh, the trees. So all this stuff that I'm laying in is behind the tree. I will lay the light of the building in. That's probably what you're referring to. Uh, yes, go ahead. Another question from Denny out there was, do we keep tones heterogene or homogene on the palette? Which one is better for finding good tones? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Uh, the easiest thing for me to answer would be you, if you, I lay my, my palette out in what I call spectrum, almost like a rainbow. So if you think of white, yellow, orange, red, deep red, kind of deep blue, a little bit more of a blue green, all the way on to finally maybe your earth tones, which are, so that's basically how I lay palettes out. So I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to. If, if it's not, if you could clarify that, I'd be more than happy to give you a better answer. Uh, someone actually had asked earlier about um, the palette. If you wanna go through that again, I'll, I'll write down. Yeah, palette starts on the left-hand side. Yeah, I mean, I, you don't have to lay it out this way. Uh, it's the way that I have learned over the years to lay it out. I start with a um, white, mm -hmm. then I do a yellow. If I need a bright yellow, if you notice on this painting, I do not have a bright yellow. Why don't I have a bright yellow? Very simply, if you look at what I'm painting, I don't see the need. See, I hate to waste paint. I'm frugal that way. Uh, but I, I don't see a need to lay out a color that I really don't need. So, so yellow would be my next color. The, the color I always lay out, because it's in almost every painting you do. In fact, it's one of the primary colors for mixing flesh tones. And that is, uh, uh, excuse me, yellow, uh, yellow ochre. Yellow ochre. Uh, then I work, if I need to, I actually threw a little cat orange in today. Uh, but then I usually go to a red, and I either go with a cad red medium or a cad red light. Uh, those give you that. Those are your strength colors. So if you need a pop, you need a really strong pop of color. Those colors are going to give it to you. All right. Once I get that in, then basically what I do is I, excuse me. Once I have that down, then I go to the alizarin crimson. That's a color I always lay out on my palette. Why do I lay it out? Very simply. It's because it is the darkest warm color you can lay out, being hot, hot color. So because of that, I can mix that into my foreground and I can actually create a warm, dark, almost black if I need to. So that's, that's the reason that I would lay, that I would use alizarin crimson. Alizarin crimson would become next. In this case, I have a purple on my palette. Uh, it's because I already had it. Uh, I normally wouldn't lay it out for this, but I didn't want to waste it. I already had it on my palette from a, a painting that I was working on earlier this afternoon. Uh, so that's why. But purple would be the next if you need it, if you need it. Now, along with that, you, if you need, in my case, I added a couple of light blues, uh, two different light blues, one a little bit more green, which is the turquoise. I don't always lay them out, but because of the water, the sky, it was appropriate for me to lay those colors out. Um, finally, I go to sap green, which is a color I always have in my palette. Some, some artists prefer viridian. Um, uh, the reason I don't use viridian that much is because viridian tends to be really strong. So if I paint something in, with viridian, it just, it's lively. It's great if you need a lively color. So if you want to, you can use it sometimes in water. It'll, it'll, if you need a lively 
color in the water, you can lay that out. Uh, finally, I finish with a burnt umber or some sort of dark warm. Uh, I think what I have down instead of burnt umber here is um, something called, it's very similar to burnt umber, uh, asphaltum. It's just, it's a color like burnt umber. It's maybe a little bit darker. So I've, I've actually blocked in what I consider the shadow side of all the whites on the buildings, which have a lot of blue in them. Now, to answer the question that I was asked earlier, I'm gonna lay the lights in. Once those are in, I'm gonna start working on the trees. Then we'll go back and that's my star right there. So I'm, I'm holding on that. I'm holding on that. That's what I really wanna slow down and do a little bit more refined statement. In. So in case you're wondering, I know what I, I, I've demonstrated often, I, sometimes people are, I know they're back there going, well, when's he gonna put that in? When's he gonna do that? It's like when I do portraits, if I do, do a demonstration, I know everybody's going, when's he gonna put the eyes in? When's he gonna put the eye? And I put the eyes in much later because that, that begins to finish the portrait. So right now we're gonna put a little bit of a light on the light side. And because there's sunlight, I'm using a little yellow ochre in that white because it's being hit by sun. So I wanna warm up that white. Now take a look at that nice, is that a nice bright white? And we'll kind of put it in on the side of the building that side of the building, the body of it. Now it goes straight down and then it's gonna be overlapped by some trees down in here eventually. So we're just gonna kind of indicate it there. It's a little bit of light, little sliver. So I just use the corner of the brush this time, the light right here. And a little sliver of light right here. These are the dormers of the built this presidio building. So you can kind of see it almost, uh, almost starts to take on a little bit of form there. Uh, there's a little bit of light right here. And I've missed a little bit of a darker blue up in here before the window goes in. I'm gonna get a little bit of light in on the side of this side. So now we've got pretty much, there's a little bit of light somewhere down underneath. So I'm just gonna kind of block something in. And the one thing I didn't do that I'm gonna do right now is get the side of this particular architecture. Now, let me mention something about architecture. Uh, architecture is a little, I, I'm not gonna say it's like figurative work because it's not, but architecture, if you think about it, has to be accurate. Uh, it has to be geometric, meaning that there's an obvious uh, construction to it. A tree, let's talk about a tree. A tree can be all kinds of things. You can find a tree that bends this way, you can find a tree. So it's not as crucial when you're painting any sort of foliage that it is anywhere near as refined, say, as architecture. Now, if you're going to do figurative work, it's a whole other work. That's a whole other ball game because figurative work requires um, anatomy, proportion, and all of these other elements. So they all have different characteristics. If you understand that and you've practiced it enough, you can actually create the, the illusion. So I'm going to paint these trees, particularly when it comes to the edges of the trees, a lot different than I painted some of the other elements. I'm just gonna kind of lose edges like that. And I'll, every time my brush overlaps into the blue, I end up picking a little, a little blue, which means I generally have to go back and deepen the color that I'm working with. So we're gonna start this thing very simple. There's some, a little bit of light on these trees too. And this is pretty much sap green and a little bit of burn upper in there. Someone had a question earlier about uh, what your opinion is of Prussian blue. I love Prussian blue. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love Prussian blue. It's a color that I lay out quite often. I was in a, I, I was in a habit of doing it for a while. I haven't laid it out for some time. I, I think it's just a great blue. Uh, it's, but if I ever have Prussian blue on my palette, I will still always have ultramarine on, on it too. Great question, by the way, great question. If we haven't seen all your questions or answered all your questions, um, 
please type it again. I'm sorry if I've missed some. Yeah, I love questions like that because I, I didn't say it. I didn't even bring up pressure blue. There's all kinds. There are a lot of specialty colors that you guys can add to your palette. The more you've painted, the more adept you've become at painting in different kinds of subjects, the better you are at understanding what palette you need for any specific painting. Let me give you an example. Let's say I want to do a painting, a night painting. All right, I'm not going to be using a lot of white. I, I, I still am going to need white on my palette because there are going to be some lights in there for it to read, but I, there are other colors that I will use more of. I'll probably use a lot more blue, a lot more green, a lot more brown. So different palettes. And let's say I want to paint a real, uh, let's say a very um, water with sun coming off of it and you get a lot of sunset. So I may have some, uh, it's going to be light and it's going to be warm. So I'm going to want my palette to reflect that. And so if you, if you lay your palette out for your subject, it makes a lot of sense. Now, one of the things I want to mention is, as you see, the way I'm laying the paint down is kind of, sometimes I'm really pushing and just doing that, but sometimes I'm just barely, barely letting the edge of my brush touch. Just, I almost don't feel it touch the surface. Now, why am I doing that? Because I can get the feeling of the kind of pine edges. So I'm not, it's not real harsh and firm. And it's one of those things. Sometimes if you notice, I'll even push or I might pull a little bit. All right. They're all for effects. You're creating effects, which is one of the things. And the, uh, let me mention something else. It's, I've had students say, well, I lose my place when I paint things like this. I don't know if I'm painting this, this area or this area. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter as long as in the long run, it looks and feels, for lack of a better word, comfortable. A few more questions. If you sure. Um, what are the limits of painting? I don't know what you mean by that. There, there are no limits. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you're talking about size, style. Um, it's exactly what you're referring to. How long can you stand, Craig? How long can huh? you stand? Sorry, I'm sorry. I couldn't hear you, Hector. I missed that, Hector. Oh, I said it's probably just how long you can sit or stand. That's probably the limit. How long oh. you can sit or stand. <laughs> oh. <laughs> a painting for me could take anywhere. This is a study. This, when, I, when you do these workshops and we do things like this, we do demonstrations, these are studies. Uh, when I do a painting, People will ask me, how long do you spend on a painting? Okay, uh, I've been asked that question many times. My answer generally is anywhere from one to seven days. And that's usually it. So what makes the difference? Size and content. Size and content make the difference. In other words, if it's something's really got a lot going on in it, I'm gonna need more time. Um, it, simple. The simplest way to think about that is if I'm gonna do a painting with one figure in it uh, and I, I, I spend maybe two days, that means I've got two days on one figure, of, that'll probably come out pretty good. All right, now, if I'm painting three figures in two days, I can't even give a day to a figure. All right, I'm just using figures. That's, not, that's with no other subjects in there. So you can kind of, through math, you can figure it out. The more you have, the longer it's going to take you. The other element is scale. And that there is actually a third element that I'm leaving out. And that third element is style. So let's say uh, we got people who come in and they say, man, I want to, I love photorealism. I want to be a photorealist. They realize you had a young student, a uh, guy that's doing just incredibly, he graduated a few years ago. We went through our undergraduate graduate program. Uh, and he did some gorgeous still lifes that look just, they had paintings of prunes that felt like you could touch them. They were that good. So I said to him, I said, that's, that's just beautiful. How long did you spend on it? He said, 90 hours. Uh, he ended up going to grad school and his style changed. He's very loose and impressionistic now. For two reasons. One is the time. And the other is, and I, I like to stress this a lot. And I don't think it's it's talked about enough in, I don't know if it's talked about enough in any major, but truthfully, everybody goes into art, whether it's fashion, whether it's 
illustration, whether it's painting, whether it's because it's fun. And people forget that. Uh, it's one of the things, <laughs> it's really hard because school is demanding. All school, law school, anything. All, everything is demanding. So art is no different. Art is no different. You, it, we had a young lady that worked in our department um, who had gone to Chapel Hill Law School. And she was an AA for, well, probably for us, meaning uh, administrative assistant, probably about, God, I'm trying to remember, oh, uh, 26 years ago. And I remember her telling me one time, she thought art school was more difficult than law school. <laughs> and by that, she loved it. She absolutely loved it because she was doing what she wanted. She was having fun, but it was work. And it is, I mean, anything you want to get good at is work. Uh, but my gosh, you know, using myself as an example, I've been doing this for ever. I mean, I'm, if it seems like forever, it's not, but uh, I've been doing this as, and I don't mean teaching, I mean painting. Teaching is just part of what I do. Um, I enjoy it. I enjoy the whole concept of helping people like you guys achieve what I've been able to achieve, which means I've made my living drawing and painting. That's, a, that's you know, my dad was a, was a truck driver, my mom a dance teacher. Uh, and I've made my living painting. And because of that, I've traveled the world. Um, and because I've traveled the world, I started painting the world. Uh, that's a lot of my subjects are from my travels because I, uh, a friend of mine once said, paint what you love and someone will, will also love it. And I had a long time thinking about, well, what is it besides my family? What is it I really love? And I painted my family, I've got portraits of my children hanging. Uh, my wife has posed for all kinds of things. Um, you know, their models that just happen to have around. But my word, just think about it, you guys. I mean, this is something you can do for a living. This is incredible. Can I ask you a few more questions? Absolutely. Um, if I talk too much, you can interrupt me. <laughs> I'm interrupting you. Um, do you prefer print? Uh, Printing out your reference rather than using a monitor. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you 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 realize that, huh? So, I'm laughing because we've been talking about setting up a monitor um, for I'm, four years. And we I'm old school now, as as I think Hector mentioned. Uh, my background when I first started working was that of a commercial illustrator. I did had a lot of clients, did a lot of work for a lot of different industries, advertising, books, probably more film than anything, movie posters probably did film posters that you guys would, would you might not because you guys might be younger, but, um, and it was, it was an exciting training ground. It was just a very, very good training ground. And so because of that, I've been able to um, take, use my, make money using my abilities and having fun and transitioning into a gallery painter from a commercial illustrator. So it's that, it's that variation that is for me exciting. It's the difference. The challenge that I had being an illustrator was one thing. The challenge I have being a painter is a totally different thing. And they're both fun. I'm still learning. Uh, I learned from my students. They learn from me. I learn from my other instructors, um, which I probably didn't mention. I should. I'd be I'd be really remiss if I did not give kudos to our uh, faculty. Our faculties. This is true in all departments. Um, I don't know. There's so many departments. I obviously do not know all the faculty members, but I know faculty members in certain departments. Uh, some in the illustration faculty teach for us. Uh, I have animation students. Uh, our faculty is just really well versed. Uh, many of them have backgrounds not that dissimilar to my background, be it a storyboard artist or concept design that has become a, a, just an exceptional painter. 
uh, I had to step back every now and then. If you guys, I don't know if you can see, but what sometimes I just move out of the way so that I can see my painting from a little bit further away. I want to see if I like the edges, if I like the overall movement that's going on. Um, you, uh, a couple more. Sure, right, please ask. Can I continue? Um, compared to other mediums in art, why do you use oil paint? Boy, that may be. So far, that's. I don't want to. I don't want to give prizes, but that might be. <laughs> The best question. Uh, let me let me preface it by saying uh, I learned when I was an art student. The first medium I learned to paint in was gouache, which is kind of, for those of you that don't know, is an opaque version of watercolor, uh, and that was several of my first classes were in that. From that, you got to remember when I went to school, it was in the '60s in college art school, and Acrylics were the big rage. So I painted in acrylics probably more than any other medium during my illustration career. Uh, as, as I moved on and I went to different shows and I saw went to museums and saw old illustrations and paintings, I became more and more enamored with the character of oil. Uh, there are something that you cannot get from other mediums. Although I love all, almost all mediums. I like watercolor. I work in watercolor occasionally, not a lot. Uh, but oil for me is the biggest challenge. It, it, there are more things that you can do with oil. To me, the second most versatile is acrylic. I can, I can make acrylic look like oil. Uh, it can make acrylic look like watercolor. So I like mediums. I like pastel. I like um, charcoal, just as a drawing medium. I probably as a drawing medium, that would be my favorite. Uh, just plain old charcoal, uh, everything from from uh, compressed charcoal to charcoal pencil to vine charcoal. It's all neat. Uh, watercolor is exciting and very versatile, particularly on location. Although on location, I've really worked hard to become good at oils. And a lot of it has to do with the painters I admired when I went to museums. So one of the questions, to answer that question in a shorter, not as, not as, as verb as, or not as verbose, or I'm not uh, going on as much, probably because when I went to museums, the work that inspired me the most was in oil. And that's probably why I personally work in oil. But I've got a very good friend, uh, an artist named Gil Dillinger, who does acrylics and pastels only. He doesn't he doesn't do oil. And exceptional. John Poon, one of our instructors in uh, landscape painting, only works in acrylic. Used to work in oils. Developed an allergy, believe it or not, and now works in acrylics. And if you saw his acrylics, you wouldn't know they were acrylics. So, you know, it's I, I'm one of these people that I believe the more things you're good at, the better your opportunity is in your future. And that means going into other, other areas of paint of art, be it, uh, be it graphic design or uh, advertising of, of some sort, illustration, visual development, any of these things, game design. Uh, I know a couple of game designers that have become outrageously great painters because they they paid their dues they've done their work in game design and now strictly they're where they're they, they're back to where their heart is at and that's creating art paintings um so is it okay to use liquid medium to mix with oils or do you lose quality no uh some people uh, let me explain something i learned about eight years ago and i mentioned john poon uh John had been a student at the academy and was so darn good, went out and just hit hit the big time as a painter. Um, so we grabbed him up, we said, John, we want you to teach for us. John came back and taught. Eventually he moved to uh, Utah, which is where some of his family was. And he loves the landscape there. And shortly thereafter, he, he also teaches online for us right now. Uh, shortly thereafter, he called me up and he said, 
I've got an allergy. I can't figure out what it is. It was, it wasn't the oil. It was the liquid. But the liquid got to him so bad that he developed such an allergy that he couldn't even fill his go to the pump and fill his car with gas. As soon as he laid off that, and he called me up and we talked for a while because he knew I had paint, painted in acrylics. And I said, John, you can get the same quality. You just have to familiarize yourself with the medium. Well, to make a long story short, he's done that. He does absolutely incredible acrylic paintings, uh, landscapes, believe it or not, and sells them quite, quite well. So I quit using liquid when John told me that story. And I haven't used it since. I use something now. I don't know if it's on my it's on my palette. It's this gob of kind of, it looks like kind of clear goo. It's called Solvent Free Gel by Gamblin. And it works, I like it better than liquid. It's similar to liquid in the fact that you can use it as a medium to extend your paint. And when I want to paint thick on top of wet paint, very often I will use that medium. There are so many, honest to God, you guys, there are so many tricks, so many little things you can learn. It's, it, it's amazing. I, and like I said, I'm still learning them. So, which is great. It just means, yeah. One more thing. <laughs> this is one of the honest to God professions uh, that even during social distancing times, we can still do. Not only that, it's one of the very few professions that I can think of where you get better with age. Certain things, you know, after, if you're in advertising, they want the people that are hip and young and with it and everything going on now. And obviously, I'm not. Uh, but truthfully, painters just get better. I, uh, we're the fine wine of the art field, if you think of it that way. Do you work your color schemes to be more photorealistic or more color harmony? Color harmony. That to me is more important than I don't I don't like I think of myself and I'm just gonna refer to me. Uh, people say, well, what's your style? I, I refer to my style as painterly realism. I'm a realist, but I I like my work to look when you first glance at it, you you look at it and you say, I've had people say, look at my work and think it's a photograph. <laughs> you know, my I don't take it necessarily as an insult, but I said, just walk up close and look, look at it. And they, oh my God. So a lot of it is what you're, what you're into. If you love one thing, you can pursue it. One of our top instructors at the school uh, started as a pretty realistic plain air, meaning on location, landscape painter, and now does very uh, expressionistic and almost abstracted versions of landscapes and flowers. Does absolutely phenomenal. She's our abstract teacher, Carolyn Meyer. Um, just wonderful, wonderful stuff. It, I'm excited. She makes me want to do that kind of work when I see that stuff. So I get inspired by our instructors. I, hopefully our students do too. Uh, it's, they're just, they're neat people. They've got um, interesting backgrounds. Uh, everybody has their own take on style, which I think is one of our benefits. Uh, getting back to the academy again, one of our benefits is that we don't, we don't teach a style. We try and just let you get good, but we always start, always start with an element of what you might think of as realism. Because once you can do that, everybody, our abstract painters, everybody that goes through our program, starts with that they they're they're taking a still life painting they're taking any people always i've heard this say oh my god i thought still life painting was going to be the boring most boring thing in the world and after they've taken it they say wow this is really i didn't realize and it's the best way to learn if you, again think about it you're painting from real life a subject that doesn't move so you learn a tremendous amount can you talk briefly about quick studies and how it's helped you in plain air? Yeah. So I taught down south for several years before I came to the academy, for about 16 years. And being a, a northern, uh, a native northern Californian, 
uh, I really wanted to get back here and not spend my entire life in LA. Um, although it was just a phenomenal place to start a career, truthfully, for me. Um, while I was there and I was teaching, uh, I was getting a little frustrated with a couple of my classes because what I was finding was students would try and be so realistic right from the beginning. They tried to make, every, in other words, they, they put buttonholes in things. I mean, it was just, and I, I kept trying to get everybody to be a little bolder and I wasn't having any luck. And so I went uh, and had a meeting with an ex-teacher of mine who at that particular time was a vice president. And I said to her, a little frustrating. Uh, these guys are picking at things. I can't get them to freshen up. And she said a very simple phrase to me. I'll never forget it because it led to the quick studies. The phrase was, think about changing the pace. So I'm adding a little bit of detailed information to that roof line. Um, so in any event, I gave it some thought. I went back. And the next week, I told everybody to bring in eight small boards, canvases, whatever they were working on. They brought them in. And for two weeks, I had them do nothing but in, in a 25-minute paintings, studies, so to speak. Because obviously, you're not going to do a finished painting probably in 25 minutes. Um, I found I was shocked at the progress that I saw just in that two weeks. So eventually, came up to the academy in 1990 and decided to take that whole concept and produce a whole class in that. And in that class, we do 25 minute paintings all day or 40 minute. We, in the morning, we do 25s. In the afternoons, we do 40s. Now you might question what that forces you to do. Somebody asked me one time, how can I learn to edit my work down and simplify it? And I answer it just by saying, give yourself a shorter time frame because you can't put everything in. Think about it. You cannot put everything in in a shorter time frame. All right. So by forcing yourself to spend less time, you have to leave some things out. Trial and error is what teaches you what to leave out. I mean, I can sit there behind somebody and say, leave that up. Nope, don't put that in. Nope. But in the course of a semester, if you're doing, oh, say, five quick studies a day, plus homework, but five quick studies a day, think about how many paintings you're doing in the course of a semester. Multiply five times 15. It's about 75. You get 75 paintings under your belt, and I guarantee you, you're going to be a better painter. That's just it. We paint from life. We paint, we paint figures, we paint still lifes, we paint land, we paint location work, we go on location. So we don't just paint one thing. Uh, over the course of the years, it's I, I've been pleasantly surprised to see how popular this course has become. Uh, I have people going, I have people going to for undergraduate school, then going into graduate school, taking it twice in undergraduate, and then come back and taking it twice in graduate. I keep saying to them, I said, why? And they just, they said, practice. It's the best practice class I have, and which is true. And it goes back to something I said earlier on, how do you get better at anything? It's practice. And that's what these guys do. They practice, they practice, they practice. Okay, I want to see where we're at because I want to start going back on the tree and I want to go back. Hey, Craig. Yes. And I think you're, you're touching on a lot of the comments that came in earlier. Um, there's some people out there that are first timers and they're saying, you know, how do I get over my fear of getting started? How do I start? Is it a certain medium I should be starting with first to learn? Uh, how do I keep from getting discouraged? Oh. Hey, uh, <laughs> let me address that last point first, if you don't mind. Yeah, careful. Uh, Sorry about that. So I came to art school 
around 1966. It's 19 years old, so you can do the math, figure out how old I am. Uh, but the simple fact of the matter is, I couldn't paint. I thought I should, I thought I could paint. I had never painted, but hell, I could draw pretty well. I could draw better than anyone I knew. So I thought, this painting stuff, poof. First Friday, I was in art school. I had a painting class. And I did terrible. I, I mean, it was really, it was, it was sad. Uh, so for the next two years, I sat much the same as many of my students do now, kind of frustrated because I wanted to be better. Darn it, you know, I watched my teachers work and they're so damn good and they make it look like it's the most fun thing in the world. I wanted to be like that. Well, at the end of about two years of struggle, I did some paintings and they were, none of them were, they were terrible, but they weren't really good. Um, and particularly when I, I measured them against paintings that I thought that were very good, but I kept at it, didn't give up, went home in the summers, worked, practiced, beginning of my junior year, did a painting of an elephant of all things was some assignment we had about doing a wildlife. So I picked an elephant, and found some nice photos. You can see, by the way, you guys, I don't want to get off track here, but I'm adding a little bit of light to the trees. Uh, so anyway, going back to that, did an elephant. It actually came out good, you know, and I, I was proud of it. It was the first painting I'd done that I thought was good. I mean, I, like I said, I'd done paintings, none of which I thought were really good, that a few were fine and I get decent critiques, but to me, they were okay. All of a sudden I did this painting and it came out good. And I began to realize that this practice stuff paid off. The stuff that I, where I worked and worked and worked, it paid off. It was starting to, to pay dividends and I was seeing decent, now, the one thing I was a little bit wrong about is I just assumed that because I did this elephant came out good, that every from that point on, everything I did would be pretty good. And uh, that's not true. That's just, it's not true to this day. It's not true to this day. Uh, the bad ones that I do to nowadays aren't as bad as the bad ones I used to do. Let's put it that way. So what happens is your bad ones get better. And every now and then you really do a good one. And that's what that's like that's like the drug that keeps us going. We all we all just crave that. When when we hit one and it just goes right, it's like the world is everything in the world is great. And then you go ahead and you work and you do another one, it, it comes out fair, doesn't come out as good. Well, over the years, I've realized this. And so I don't beat myself up anymore, which goes back to the thing, the, the line about uh, that I think I used it when, in our warmups. And I I'll, I'll, uh, should mention it to all of you because it's, it's so true. Uh, it's a very good friend of mine who's an exceptional, very almost abstract and figurative painter, uh, a gentleman named Dan McCall. Dan has got a line and it says, every artist must learn to make frustration their friend. Man, I heard that and I went, that, that says it. That's what I've been trying to say to all these guys. Uh, in other words, there's gonna th be things you do and they're just not gonna come out good. Just, so I have kind of come up with a theory that what everyone needs to do is begin to learn how to enjoy the process of painting not always the results. Very simply, you may not be satisfied. I'm not satisfied all the time. In fact, many times I'm not satisfied. So, but if you enjoy the process and understand that you're learning, that'll go a long way. That, I can say that for any one of these majors that we might be talking about, truthfully. It's true in every major, no matter. I mean, I can't use computer. Thankfully, I can paint because I, I, I'm lost on a computer. Uh, I call some of my teachers and people in other departments 
hey, how do I do this? How do I do that? So, and it's part of it is I didn't grow up with them like a lot of you guys are doing. A lot of you are all growing up with computers. So for many, uh, working with a computer becomes almost second nature. For me, it's like a struggle to figure it out and learn it. It's neat, but I'd rather be painting. So uh, I found my passion. And my passion may or may not be your passion. I just hope you guys find it. Because I'll tell you what, it's a hell of a nice way to make a living. It really is. You know, being able to do art, whether it's art for t-shirts, whether it's art for uh, fashion, whether it's art for a movie where you're working with a team, um, all that stuff. It's all just exciting and fun stuff. Okay, so let's get let's go up to our star now. And then if I have time, I'll go back and do a few more branches in the trees. Um, I haven't used some of the other tools that I like to show. I always like to show people how you can use a knife for some things just by kind of dipping it in. Um, getting it really wet and being able to come in with marks like that, drawing marks, a branch that might go like that, come in here. This branch, you do all kinds of fun little things with a, with a knife. Anyway, I want to go back to what I was just uh, about, to, about to tackle. I was going to get the fog in, then we're going to go in, and I've got to slow down, and I'm going to show you how to use something I call a ball stick. Uh, but first, we're going to lay a little bit of that um, fog in, much the same as I put in already. And then I'm going to try and paint a little bit of this bridge so we see it almost through the fog. So back to the white with a little bit of other color mixed in. We'll see what we got here. That, that feels pretty good because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of fuzz it. All that paint is wet. So just by light touch, I'm going to get a little bit of that paint off and we're going to bring it down, bring it over in here. Mixing, I'm actually mixing it into the, the blue color that I have. So it's blending just because as I push it, it picks up some of that blue. And I can bring it down and let that fog kind of disappear into the blue. So it's really bright at the top. I'll stand back, take a look. Does it feel pretty good? Yeah, it does, but I think I can bring that fog down a little bit further. So we're gonna bring it down in here, kind of brush it over a little bit, put a little bit of it back in here. And all I keep doing is brushing it back into that blue. And there's fog right here between and a little bit up in here. And this comes down a little further. And I'm just... Uh, another trick with learning how to paint um, is learning how to begin to observe or see your subject in a specific order. Uh, one of the biggest problems that a lot of times people that are just starting is they immediately look for the detail. Well, the detail only happens after everything else is beginning to work. After you get your basic colors, basic values, all of these things. When, once these things are beginning to work, then you can actually go in and start to add what, we, what you might think of or we might call detail. So I'm just lightly brushing over some of this. I'm going to take some of that blue. I'm just going to bring it a little bit over the mountain, a little bit over that mountain right there. That feels pretty good, OK? So I'm relatively, for a quick painting, relatively pleased with that. Uh, I want to slightly extend that down if I can. So bring that color down. I'm looking at, at time, because I would like to be able to finish this up in about the next 20 minutes. Does that sound good to you, Hector? Absolutely, Craig. I think okay, we're just in there. Uh, those of you in the chat, are you guys okay out there? Do you guys want to see this thing finished? I know they want to see me do the bridge, so I'm gonna let's get let's get into that. Uh, uh, we're getting a lot of yeses. I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> just let us know if it goes. We already had dinner, so I'm just fine, you guys. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I'm ready for midnight if you guys are. <laughs> and hey, folks out there, once again, hey, uh, if you're working on any art out there right now, absolutely, guys. If you have anything you're working on, go ahead and put it in the hashtag. If there's any paintings you just want to show off, even if it's not a landscape, go ahead and upload it with that hashtag so we can all check it out. I've seen four paintings posted up so far here, so please feel free to post any work if you want to share. Paintings, drawings, they don't have to be paintings. I just like looking at art. So now this is, this gets tricky because this has to be a little bit more precise. Now I could be really, if I'm doing a real small painting, I just might go, whoop, put it in there. But I'm trying to show as many little things for all of you to, to look at. So this is just an old stretcher bar. See this? So none of this paint is very thick. So I can actually lay the stretcher bar down into this really lightly. And I can take, this brush loaded with the color that I have, making sure I have enough medium in it so it goes down. Yeah. And which I didn't like the color I had, so I just remixed the color. I had I think I had it too light. So I'm gonna really lightly again go right about here and we're gonna put that nice and I'm brightening it up. So someone was asking me about photorealistic. This is not, I'm, in, I'm enhancing the color. I want that bridge to stand out a little bit more. So I purposely brightened it up. But I know the bridge quite well. I travel it, this is how I get into the city. I live in the North Bay. So, so there we have the first part of that bridge. Now we're gonna do the other side. Now, if I pick up any paint on, the, on this, I just wipe it off. And I do the same thing on the other side. Put it right here, go right from the top, straight down, and lift up. Straight down, or lift up. Do it again. This is how we have that bridge disappear into the fog. So I've got it. I like the color. Uh, it's, it's much stronger, which is fine. Now I'm going to paint the cross members, I'm going to try and get them in there. And then I'm going to paint the shadow. There's a shadow on that bridge, which gives it dimension. Because there's light hitting up here, there's sunlight. It's starting to stand out. Now I'm going to do the, I'm going to fade this more just so you guys, so if you guys are wondering, so well, it doesn't look really like it's, well, it's because it's not done. Another line I use, uh, tell people is, is to help people get over frustration is remember you'll never ever do a bad painting because any painting can be turned into a good painting. So you're not doing bad paintings, you're just doing unfinished paintings. So we're gonna to wanna to get that, I wanna get the basic structure relatively correct and so I'm taking a little bit more time and care. As I mentioned earlier, I said, this is our star. This is the star of the painting. So what I did is I set everything up for this. So everything else is in place for this particular moment, which is the... Uh... Now, one of the things I want to do, I don't want to do it to just this, because I want to do it with the shadow too. But this is actually going to fade down in here. So next thing I want to put in here is the shadow. And then we're going to put a little bit of this bridge in, in because I almost see it in the, um, in the fog. As it comes down here, a little bit of the bridge, just, just a hint. And so because the paint's wet, I can actually do that relatively easy. Uh, it's just, it's, it's more technique oriented. I'll show you in a second. Okay, let's get, let's paint the shadow of that. So what I did is I just mixed a little blue into that color. A um, little bit more. I want to make sure I get enough dark in it. It's pretty dark. Now I've just put my head up there to look at it. You have to be kind of careful and get this color about right. That This might be too dark. I'm going to put one stroke down and check. Yeah, it's a little darker than I want. So what, what that means, I'm going to add a little more white to it. 
And this is this is where experience and judgment comes in. In other words, it's it's way in the background, so I don't want it to be too bright. If otherwise, it's going to want to come into the foreground and and become uh, competition to the tree. And the tree is our foreground, so there's the shadow. It's basically the exact same color I was using with a little blue and a little white mixed into it. So I'm going to use this again. I'm going to come right down a little more careful. We have the side of the bridge. Obviously, I had a little dirty paint on it. Let's get rid of that. Uh, let's go back and do the other side. And we're going to do it right here. Again, it helps if you know the bridge. Like I said, when I go into San Francisco and go to, this, go to school, I go in this way. Uh, so I cross it pretty much daily. Um, so I kind of, I do know the bridge. So I kind of, it helps because I know what to look for. It's one of the advantages of if you have, if you had the opportunity of painting something before, or if you painted something on location, uh, it's really nice because what it allows you is to understand even more closely exactly what you're painting. So I just study where before I was studying simple big shapes, now I'm looking for a lot of the smaller indications that make this thing more finished, that make this bridge feel more complete. If I mess up, I'll take this color again and go back and fix it. So don't be afraid of, what, probably one of the worst things anybody can do when they're painting is being afraid of making mistakes. It shows in the timid approach that you have. You have to be, confident enough and I'm, I'm throwing a, a lot of lines out that I use in class that, tonight so uh, and one of them is uh, always paint like you know what you're doing but assume you're probably wrong uh, and let me explain that a little bit more thoroughly it means that you have to be authoritative you have to be confident when you put a stroke down even if that stroke's wrong, you can always fix it. You don't have to live with it. It's one of the wonderful things about painting, particularly oh, painting in an opaque, me opaque medium. If you're painting in watercolor, it's very hard to do this. But if you're painting in oil, acrylic, gouache, pastel, you can go back and fix anything at any time. And it, it's a great comfort if, for, for a painter to know that their paint, they can be wrong, and still have the opportunity to go back and fix it. So without going any further, the hardest part of this whole painting is gonna be getting these in. It's always the most difficult part. So we're gonna leave that alone. We're gonna try and paint a little bit of that bridge back in the fog. And I'm working like with a number three brush, flat brush, just so you, you guys know. Uh, this is probably gonna be a little too dark, but I don't mind starting with this. This is about where the bridge would be, and I'm just going to kind of indicate it. Did you ever, <clears throat> did you ever feel like you wanted to um, not finish a painting or um, I don't know what, did you mean leave, not? leave a painting unfinished? Yeah, I have a lot of them like that. Uh, do I want to? Boy, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, there are paintings that I've done that are more like studies and I will leave it at an unfinished stage. And sometimes when I look back at it, I like it even more. So to answer your question, I guess the answer to that is probably yes. Um, it's not my intent to do that. It's not, but at the same time, absolutely. It just, it's one of those things that happens every, it depends upon what you, you know, let me go into another little, uh, dissertation here. Uh, the word intent comes to mind. Uh, most artists that have painted for a long period of time have an intent. They know what they want their painting to look like as a finished piece. Uh, in some instances, many artists underfinish their pieces because that's their style. Um, 
I underfinish at times because I like it, but it is never usually, it doesn't start out as an intent. My intent usually is to do a finished painting, yet as during the process, many times I will begin to discover things saying, you know, I like that. I don't want to go any further with that. So it, it really depends upon if you, you need to know yourself and what your goals are as you set out to do any piece of art. Every, all, we all have goals. We all start out wanting our painting to look this way or that way. Uh, it, let me give you an example right now. Uh, everybody has a different type of intent at different times. Uh, I've gone through many, many different intentions. At present, I'm very interested in a tactile quality, which I'm not doing here, because this is more of a quick study. Now, what I want to do is there's a little bit of feeling of white water way back in the distance. Yeah, I might want to. I'm going to raise the camera just so you can see. What way back in the distance. So what we've done is we've not. created that shore <laughs> way back there. There's also where this pier is. You can see right now I've, where I've laid this uh, piece down, I've scarred this a little bit. So I go back and touch it up. Remember I said, anything you do that's wrong can't be fixed. So you have to be aware of that. Now, right here, right about in here, there's a little bit of white water I see. A little bit right in there. Probably a little too strong, which is, I don't care because I'll just take the color, this under, that underneath color, which is this, hit some striations, and we'll go back and we'll carve and make that a smaller, more narrow piece of white water. All right, and on the top of that um, pier, it's receiving light, and the light is right about here. And it looks like there's a second tier to it down about here. Just going to indicate these are indications. So one of the things that we try and do, and uh, the visual development people love this stuff, is uh, learn how to indicate. Learn how to indicate. Not necessarily paint everything, but make it feel like you're painting everything. And uh, a lot of the visual development work is really dependent upon that kind of, of thought process. I'll tell you who else tends to, I've, I've known a couple of, when I was in school, a couple of my roommates were automotive, were really into automotive, that was their major. And uh, they've all gone in, eventually, they went to work for GM, they've, and now they all paint, and they're watercolorists, most of them are watercolorists, and they do really nice work. Uh, and I do, I have a very good friend in Arkansas that's an archi that's a was a retired architect, and he paints in watercolor. His name is Richard Stevens. No relationship to, to our Stevens at the Academy, but um, he's really terrific. I was just talking to him on, on uh, the computer today, and he, he does some wonderful work. So a lot of these guys, it's really, it's wonderful to see this, you know. There is such a camaraderie among, among uh, artists in general and an appreciation and knowing that we're all, we all constantly and continually learn from each other. And so one of the wonderful things about going to the type of school that I'm teaching at now, which is the academy, which is what you guys are all looking at, uh, is the networks that you build. I'm, I'm telling you, uh, they are lifelong. They will be your friends. Uh, Anna can probably attest to that. One of her, um, some of her friends are, exceptional uh, people that work at Pixar, at Disney. So, and I mean, she still keeps in touch with many of her cohorts that were students finding out what they're doing nowadays. Am I correct, Anna? You want to address that a little bit? Uh, sure. I think, you know, when you, when you attend art school and you go through these classes together and um, we all have an admiration for one another. That's first and foremost, I think. And we learn so much from each other. So it's, it's great to keep those relationships going. And um, yeah, I've been really fortunate to have some of our really close friends from 
school days come in and be part of our faculty and uh, just to share yeah. their knowledge. I remember being so impressed with them then when I was in school and I'm still amazed by them all. I, I picked up a fan brush, everybody. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, the reason I picked it up is I want to do some real soft stuff. Fan brushes also are great if you ever want to do palm trees, by the way. A good friend of mine that said he wants me to teach a, a workshop on how to do palm trees. Um, and it's really just learning how to use a certain kind of brush a certain way. So what I want to do is I want to slightly fog back some of this. So we're going to pick up a little of this. I'm just going to brush over. So you see, just really lightly, really lightly. Even if I blur it a little bit, even if I smear the paint a little bit, doesn't matter. Just want to, I want to hide it. So it, because that's what fog does. Fog diffuses. So what we're doing is we're diffusing. So that, that yeah. it kind of feels like, yeah, it feels like the bridge is kind of lost there. And the, the part that I hate the most I'm going to do right now, uh, it's the hardest thing for me to do. Uh, and I've talked with many, many uh, young artists and they're in agreement. And so they'll ask, how the heck do you do that? I'm going to show you. And it's, this is called, it's just basically a dowel. You see his paint all over it. It's what we, many artists refer to as a mall stick. Mall stick is something you can set up here don't rest, and rest your hand on it without resting your hand on the painting. So what I want to do is I want to bring this little part, and my paint's got to be quite wet. I want to bring this right to here. So what I want to do is I want this to sweep up and let's see what, if we can do it. I'm going to try it right now. Ready? It's okay. Not the best I've ever done, but it's not terrible either. So we're going to do the next one now. This it gets harder because we're going, we're we're going from this point, and we got to keep it somewhat parallel, and it's going to come down to about here. All right. So what we're going to do is go from here, and I'm going to look at the point I'm going to. Just missed it. Let's do it again. Okay, I can live with that. Once again, it's not great, but it's not bad. So now we're gonna go on the other side. It goes from here to here. So we're gonna go here to here. This is, by the way, I, no one asked me the question, maybe be asked, this is what we call a liner. It's a watercolor brush. And I use it for little fine things. I might use it for branches at the very end. It's, you can call it detail brush, whatever. So we're going to bring this down and it's going to disappear into the fog about in here. So it's going to come from here, down, pick up, and then disappear into the fog. And this one is going to come from here, And it's going to disappear in the fog a little bit down further. So now we've got the cables. All right, the last thing we're going to do is just do a little quick indication of some of the cables that are going down and they're even thinner. So I'm going to get real thin and I'm just going to go just indicate a little bit. Just one, two, you don't have to count. This is the problem with architecture. Any sort of architecture you do has got to be relatively accurate. And I, like I said, I'm a figurative painter. Generally, I do a tremendous amount with figures. And so for this, it's a different kind of discipline. Oops, really messed that one up. You see that? Important for you guys to see mess ups. I, I, and I, I'm not being funny with that. I actually mean that. Because I want you to see how you fix them. So I painted it back out. We'll go back with a brush. And what happened is I've got to keep that straight downward trim like that, like that, like that, that, that. I'm going to 
carry it down a little too far at times. And I'm gonna put a little bit back in here. This, we can actually bring it down further. Now, if I really wanted to get crazy, I could actually put use this and just kind of, kind of like I did with that, um, and just sweep it all the way down and do the same thing here, go here. We almost want to disappear, we don't, because we almost don't see them. So if I get them in there and they're too strong, I will take one of my really nice sables and I will just kind of brush over them a little bit. And by brushing over them, I, what I'm doing is I'm pushing it back into that glue. So it's almost disappearing. And we let the fog kind of come in and brush over them and then they disappear into the fog. So if they're standing out too much, I'm just gonna pull them down one at a time. Just kind of, just go over it because what you end up doing is you end up pushing it back into the paint. Now, when you do this, sometimes you have to come over the, the your uh, other table. That's much better than when I first just painted them in there. So this is just, a, a, these are all little tricks and learning to paint generally is learning a lot of little, learning to draw for that matter is the same thing. It's learning a lot of little, you can call them, I like to call them tricks. Let's put it that way. Some people don't, but I, because that's basically what you're doing. And I've often said, <laughs> uh, I remember saying this when I was teaching down South, that what you're doing as an artist is you're, you're like a magician and you're developing your bag of tricks. And the bag of tricks is what will get you your job because your bag of tricks creates your portfolio and shows your versatility. Uh, let's say, example, you guys, let's say you want to eventually go into teaching. The more things that you can do, the better chance you have of getting a teaching position. Because let's say you do one thing really well, but an individual institution happens to be looking for something or somebody that's maybe a very strong uh, colorist and they're looking for someone to handle more of a color class. Uh, but you haven't shown, all you've shown is charcoal drawings. So they're gonna go, well, boy, you draw well, but right now we're looking for color and we need a color teacher. So all these things, all these, everything you learn uh, while you're in school, the breadth of knowledge and the breadth of abilities that you begin to develop, honest to God, they're gonna carry you so far. And uh, who knows, you know, what you're gonna end up doing. I don't, um, not only that, but when I got out of school, a heck of a long time ago, there was no such thing as computers. There was no such thing as um, the net, any of the network we used. We used cameras when we needed to photograph something. We didn't use our phone. Um, and I know I sound like a really old person, but I'm trying to make a point. And the point that I'm trying to make is that you don't, none of us know what's going to be happening in the future in terms of the needs of an artist. One of the things I will tell you, I believe this with all my heart because I've been teaching for so darn long. If you can draw and you can use color and design well and add some original thought process to it and come up with a unique kind of a vision, there was, there was gonna be a place for you. You are gonna be able to go out and you're gonna be able to make your living as an artist and in doing so, support yourself, support your family in something that many, many folks think of as a hobby. You know, it's work. It's, this is my work, this is my hobby too, but it's my work. And when you can, when you can make uh, president of our school, Lisa Stevens, has got a lovely comment. I love it. She said, when you can make your work, your, your, so to speak, your play, you'll never really work a day in your life. And 
what by that we mean you're probably you're never going to be a gas station attendant you're never going to you know right now thankfully we need all those guys so i'm not trying to put those people down we need them desperately uh, but for people that are artistically inclined and love creating love creating um it's just wonderful i mean I feel fortunate I've been able to do this for my word now, uh, almost 50 years. In fact, it, in fact, yeah, it is. It's, it's just about 50 years worth of a, of a career now. And so, and I've done a lot of things in my career and you know why I've done them and I've been able to do them because I can draw, because I can use some sort of techniques in painting that I have a mind, I can create images that people need and people want. And that all started with incredible training. So I don't think I'm gonna carry this a lot further. If any of you guys have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. I mean, I could work on this for another three or four hours. Uh, but, you know. Hey Craig, one question that was out there was any, someone said, I'm really struggling with the water. Do you have any tips on how to create the image of the water? Well, this water is pretty easy, first of all. Let's start with this water, because there's not a lot going on. But water is, is one of the more abstract elements in painting. In other words, it's not solid form. Uh, it's, it's basically reflections, movement. If water is moving a lot, in this case, we're not getting reflections because of the fog. So. If there was no fog here, this bridge would probably be reflecting down in the water. So, you know, but because the water is very still, it was, it was one of these incredible days. And believe me, you guys, this it, this is one of the more unusual days in San Francisco Bay. The water is just beautiful. Uh, but when you, if you're gonna paint water, I always say, number one, whatever is up, is generally reflecting down. So if you look into water, and there's different kinds of water, there's moving, there's waves in the ocean, which has got a different kind of architecture look to them. The way they lift up, they become thin, almost transparent, and then they curl over the top and you begin to get white water. So that's one type of water. The other type of water is a mountain stream that might come over rocks where it, it, you can actually see somewhat of a color in the water. And as it comes over the rocks, it becomes whiter. It gets more of a froth to it. And as it splashes down, you get a big froth. Um, so that, that's two kinds of water. Then you get lake water, which is just like you go out on a, a day and there's no wind. And it's, the, it's like a mirror image in that lake. And so you see nothing but reflections. All right. Then you get something I paint a lot of. Uh, I painted a lot in Venice in the canals. And there's boats going and there's ripples. And that's where it's, that to me, that's the most fun water because what you're painting is the abstraction of the reflections in that water. Now, one last thing, if you're painting and the water is relatively still, as the water gets closer to you, you can look down and you start to see through the water. You might see just a faint indication of rocks, a faint indication of something like that. But as you glance outward, more at a distance, you get more of a reflection. The reflection might come from the sky. The reflection might come from trees on the other side of a lake. So there's a lot. You can't just say, how do you paint water? Because the different types of water all have different characteristics. The best thing uh, for people to do is truly find artists that paint water. Uh, for example, I, I can think of, uh, there's a young, there's a a, a lady right now, Catherine Pasciato, and she's taken a couple of courses at the academy. All she paints is oceans. That's all she paints is the water and oceans. Beautiful job. Um, I, I think of people like um, one of our teachers, John Poon, or, or um, Chris, Scott Christensen, who paints beautiful lake water and streams, and as the water comes close, you can see through it. So there's different kinds of water this is the easiest kind. This is, there's really not much to this kind of water. It's just more or less a color and a, um, and a value. It, it doesn't, there's not a lot of movement. 
there's fog above it. Because there's fog above it, we, um, we aren't getting a lot of reflections. So in general, it's not a, a tremendously difficult kind of water to paint. Uh, you just basically paint a pretty color and you look, you have, to, you have to have a good eye and you have to begin to look for whatever variations you might see in that water. Color variations, uh, when people paint, for example, like I just put too dark of a blue in there, but when people paint very often seascapes, they think of it as basically blues, greens, and whites, but very often there's, there's many warms in water. And so it's not just one type of, um, of water. That's why it's a very difficult question to really answer thoroughly. Hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, that's, about, that's about the best I can give you in water. Water is, people think of it as blue. No, like this, that's beautiful blue water. And occasionally we see that, but very often we don't. We see kind of a murky, we see really, I love water that's moving, that has reflections in it. That's per because you can take your brush and move it around. And if you don't like what you're doing there, you pick up one of your lights, you take your brush and you move it around a little bit more. If you don't like that, you pick up a dark slash back into it. It's just building, it's just, and it's fun. And it's never, it, it, it's never gonna be wrong because you just keep building on it. And if you get the wrong colors in there, it doesn't matter because water can reflect any color around. Hopefully that answers that. <laughs> I think so. Any other questions? That I, I think can... we've kept you guys a long time. Yeah, I talked too so, much, sorry about that. No, it's great. Thanks, thanks everybody for sticking around and joining us. Yeah. I'm... And if you can do a show a close up of the uh, painting for everybody here. I Absolutely, know. sure. I'm going to move out of the way. Excuse my camera skills. I'm. Um... How's that working for you? Looks great. What do you guys think out there? We've got a lot of thank yous out there to you all. Um, and hey, uh, on my end too, I would just tell you all, uh, thank you so much to Anna. Thank you so much to Craig for taking your evening. My pleasure. So many beautifuls and thank yous. And uh, I mean, kind words all around from all over the globe here coming in for you all. So thank you so much. Good. And you, gotta, you need to understand we love what we do. And we try and impart that to our students. So we want you to love what you do. Okay, that's a bit, that's an important part and it's your future. And if that's anybody important. anybody has any other questions beyond this and just wants to chat um, about the Academy, about our fine art program, please feel free to email either Craig or myself, cnelson at academyart.edu or anelson at academyart.edu. I mentioned the social distance learning thing I do on Friday. I did, yeah, oh, actually I did that in the chat. Um, right. But you can talk about it. Every Friday uh, for the last six weeks, tomorrow will be seven. Since we've been uh, learning at a distance, I've started doing on every Friday about an hour and a half demonstration open to anybody that just wants to watch and ask questions like you're doing now. So if you guys are free, please look. Tomorrow I'm doing a figure, uh, kind of a head and torso portrait from a black and white piece of reference talking about how you work flesh tone colors. So. Um, you're all welcome to tune in anytime. I always do them on Friday at noon and you get it right through the Academy. Well, it's on your Facebook page. And it's on my Facebook page. But um, this is fun. I love teaching. I like demonstrating. I love answering questions. Anything I can do to help people get to the point where I am so that you guys can make a life out of creating art. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And uh... You know, for me on my point, I'll, I'll wrap it up for everybody here tonight uh, that's out there. Um, and Craig and Anna, if you get a chance to check out that hashtag, you'll see some of the awesome, uh, uh, there was some really cool follow along paintings that went out. Uh, people people took a stab at the same picture. And we also just have really cool artwork that people had posted up. Some of it's sketched, some of it's digital, some of it is painted. So. Uh, definitely some really impressive stuff out there. So thank you all for participating. It's, it's awesome to see your work. I love to see that. A um, couple of things I just want to mention on my end. Uh, if there's anybody out there that's looking at joining the academy to becoming a student, um, the reason that we put these on is obviously people are at home right now. We're all trying to figure out things to do. 
And like Craig said, we're doing this social distance learning, but the Academy has been teaching online courses for over 18 years. This summer, we'll be offering two different versions of courses. We'll be teaching courses in a traditional online setting. Uh, we call that asynchronous learning where students are able to get in as they wish along the, basically learning at your own pace. We do have modules, so you have to complete them on a deadline within a week, but you can log in all throughout the week to learn as you go. And believe it or not, fine art is even something that students have been very successful in, even in the online. I know Anna is our director here. She will attest to that. But we also have another format we call synchronous learning. It'd be similar to this, but obviously in a, in a little bit more of a learning setting fashion, um, where someone like Craig obviously will be teaching a course using Zoom and doing things live in a synchronous format. So it's basically like going to class by flipping up your laptop and having an instructor like Craig to help walk you through this and teach you uh, as you're going through the course this summer. So I would just tell you, anybody's out there and you haven't applied to school or you're thinking about, I wanna get started, I'll be your guy to reach out to. I'm more than happy to stay back and answer questions in the chat. Uh, if you'd like, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and put a link in here. Uh, you have a link to our application for the university as well as my email. You can email me directly. I'll be hanging back tonight, getting back to people. But our first goal is to just schedule a one-on-one -on -one with everyone. We love to sit down with you and talk about the program, the faculty, the details, how everything works, so you can make a decision if this is going to work for you or not. But I will vouch the Academy is a wonderful university. We teach people how to become professionals. And more importantly, it's, it's putting in the hard work to become something that you really want to be and make an earning and a living at it. Uh, you know, I know Craig said it in other words, but it's one of those things where it's, it really is the difference between a job and a career is really how passionate you are about what you're doing every day. Um, and, you know, I even when I was little, I know I, I was told that the money will follow you if you're really passionate about what you're doing. So I would just tell you to, uh, you know, take that leap of faith if you find yourself in that position where you really, you really want to push yourself to do something you're passionate about. Someone out there was asking about motivation. And you know, Craig was talking a lot about how he, he's inspired by tons of different things and tons of different people. Um, I would just tell you, you know, if you're finding yourself in that situation where this is something that excites you and don't confuse being scared for also being excited. I mean, sometimes being nervous is a part of the excitement as well. But if you find yourself being in love with that process of getting better, I would tell you to follow your goals and your dreams and, and push yourself to be as great as you can by practicing and hard work. So once again, I'm going to throw in these links here, but I'd love to hear from you. Please don't leave me hanging here, guys. I want my self-esteem to be as high as possible tonight. Reach out to me, send me an email so we can connect and chat. If there's anything I can do on my end to help you to take your first steps and join the academy or even just look at learning options for you, I'm more than happy to do that tonight. I'll be hanging back. Uh, last couple things here too. I just want to take one more second here to thank uh, Anna and Craig. Craig, there was a few people out there that were like, he's a great teacher, he's a great instructor, and I definitely don't want to steal any shine away, but I think that Craig, once again, is a great example. Anna is a great example of just the level of faculty and teachers that we have here that really care about what they're doing, they care about their students. Uh, it's a, it, you know, it's, it, it speaks volumes when you see someone like Craig who uh, could be at home right now watching TV or taking it easy, but he's out here painting because he loves it. So I uh, did want to say one more time, big special thank you, shout out to Anna and Craig. Um, and uh, I will be hanging back. We'll end the broadcast here, folks, but I'll hang back a little bit in the chat to answer questions and drop links for you all. So be safe out there, everybody. I hope to see you all again on Tuesday for our next, where we're talking about uh, the film industry, going into cinematography, directing, and writing. So I uh, hope to see you all here in a couple more days. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Good night. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Okay. I'm not going to walk them thoroughly right now.